Okay, so it's it's recording. Yep. Okay, so I should I should begin then. Yes, that's a yes. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, this is this is joint work with uh, Ahmed Abdi from um, London School of Economics, uh, Gerard Cornejols from. Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh and Dabin Lee from uh, the Institute of Basic Science uh, in Korea. Um, so before I start, let me just say that I think this is a really um, beautiful topic. Um, it, it's quite an old topic that uh, many, many smart people uh, worked on and, and kind of left the area, um, but it's, it's kind of having a renaissance now um, with, well, I mean, my co-authors as being um, some some prominent people. So unfortunately for you guys, I'm probably the one that knows the least amount about this material. Um, but let me, I guess, try to do my best to convince you that uh, this is an interesting area. And um, if you want more information, um, there is uh, a nice series of posts on the Metroid Union blog. Uh, about clutters um, by Dylan Mayhew uh, from New Zealand. And Ahmed Abdi is also writing a series of posts on clutters uh, on the Metroid Union blog. Uh, so go there if you want to learn more. Okay, so, um, so this is uh, the main object uh, in this talk. It's a clutter. So a clutter is just a special type of hypergraph. Um, so the condition is that uh, no hyperedge is contained in another hyperedge. Uh, so here is just um, an example. So I've got a hyperedge on nine vertices, and um, you can check that, of course, none of these hyperedges is contained in another one. So this is an example of a clutter. And just to fix the the terminology. Uh, the set of vertices we normally call the ground set, and for some reason, um, the hyper edges we call members. Um, okay, so this is this is the main object of study uh, in this talk. Um, so let's just look at a couple examples of clutters. Um, so first off, graphs are, are clutters. Um, so take any graph. Um, the ground set will be the set of vertices of the graph, and the members, the, the hyper edges, uh, will just be the edges of the graph. Um, so here I think of an edge as just um, its set of endpoints. Um, so this is the clutter that corresponds to a five cycle. Um, so a graph itself is a clutter, but we can also get a lot of different clutters from graphs. Um, so here is another one. Um, so here I have a graph and I've fixed uh, two vertices, S and T. And the ground set of this clutter is going to be the set of edges of the graph. And the members are going to be the edge sets of the ST paths uh, in the graph, right? So I've drawn one of these ST paths in orange. And it's clear that this is a clutter because uh, no ST path uh, can contain another ST path. So this is another example uh, of a clutter. So uh, given a clutter, um, there are kind of two natural uh, optimization problems um, that you can associate with it. So one is the packing problem. Uh, so a packing is just a collection of disjoint members. Um, so if you are used to thinking about hypergraphs, this is just a, this is just a matching. And a cover is a set of elements that intersects every member, right? So this is kind of the dual notion uh, of a packing. And the two problems that we're interested in is the maximum size of a packing. So this would be the maximum size of a matching. Uh, that's called the packing number. Um, and we're also, also interested in the minimum size of a cover, right? So this is the smallest um, set of vertices that hits uh, every hyperedge. 
Um, so of course, um, the minimum is always at least the maximum. Uh, it seems kind of intuitive, but of course, if you've got a packing, um, you need to at least choose one element uh, from each one of those members um, in a cover, right? Because in a packing, uh, those members are disjoint. So the minimum is at least the maximum, right? Um, so let's just, uh, um, I guess, look at these numbers for the examples that we've seen. Um, so for a graph, um, this packing number is nothing but the size of a maximum matching, right? Because I need my members to be disjoint. So I'm looking at uh, edges which are disjoint. So it's the size of a maximum matching. And in this particular example, um, I can find two edges that are disjoint. Um, so the, the packing number is two. Um, the covering number is, well, it's, well, a cover is something that uh, intersects every edge. Um, so it's a vertex cover. And so the covering number is just the, the size of a minimum vertex cover. And in this particular example, it's three, right? So you need to actually choose um, three ed three vertices to, to hit every edge, right? So these numbers are, are not necessarily equal. And we see that um, the covering number is more than the packing number in this example. Um, so what about this clutter of ST paths? Um, so it turns out that the packing number is two. Um, so for example, I can take the topmost ST path. Oh yeah, I can also use my mouse. So I can take the topmost ST path and I can also pack in the bottommost ST path. And you, you can't do more than that. Um, so the packing number is two. Uh, the covering number, well, a cover uh, is an ST cut, right? Because a cover has to hit every ST path. Um, so it's a set of edges um, that disconnects S from, from T after you've removed them. And uh, the smallest one is, for example, you can take um, both of the edges that are incident to S, right? That would be uh, an ST cut. And that's an SD cut of, of size two, right? So uh, the covering number is two. And in this example, um, packing is equal to equal to, to covering, right? OK, so um, and this is a phenomenon that just holds in general, right? So for the clutter of ST paths, uh, the packing number is always equal to the, the covering number. Okay, so um, so I guess there are two main uh, questions that you could ask um, about clutters. Um, so the first is, well, for which clutters uh, can you compute the, the covering number efficiently? Um, so that's going to be what this talk is, is about uh, mostly. And the second question is, well, for which clutters um, can you compute um, the packing number efficiently? Um, so, um, so, I mean, I guess even for question one, uh, this is a very general question because uh, even for graphs, we don't exactly know uh, for which graphs um, the vertex cover number um, can be computed efficiently. So even, even for clutters that are come from graphs, this is quite a hard problem. Um, so let's kind of look for some sufficient conditions um, that, that solve these problems. And what would be very nice is if you could solve both of these problems um, simultaneously. All right. So let me explain uh, what I mean by that. So uh, what you could try to do, okay, so um, so here we, we want to do something even more general. We want to solve um, the covering problem where we've got weights on the elements. So this, this W vector is just uh, a set of weights um, on the elements. And what I've done here 
is I've just written out uh, a linear program that encodes um, the covering problem, right? So what I want to do is I want to minimize um, the sum of the weights um, subject to these constraints. So for a cover, I need to cover uh, every hyper edge, right? So I've got a constraint for every member and the constraint says that um, if I sum up the X values for um, the elements in that member, I should get at least one because this is supposed to be a cover, right? So if X was integer valued or, or sorry, zero one valued, um, the, the zero one vectors would precisely correspond um, to covers. Right. Um, and so, um, so this is the, the linear programming relaxation of the covering problem. And if you write out the dual LP, you get this guy, right? So uh, because I've got ones here, I'm going to maximize um, basically just the sum of the y's. So this one goes here. Uh, and then I've got a constraint now for each uh, element. And I've got a variable for each uh, member, right? And this says that the sum of those values should be at most um, this weight, right? So these are um, our dual LPs. So we know by LP duality that um, at least the fractional values of these guys are, are equal. Um, but if I insist that um, these things are integer, um, they might not be equal, right? So, um, so the nicest thing that could happen uh, is the following. So if it turns out that this dual LP has an integral optimum solution for every integer valued weight function, then we say that the clutter is a max flow min cut clutter, right? Um, so, um, so this is basically saying that um, this LP is totally dual integral, right? So this condition is, is quite strong. It actually implies that, um, that the primal is also uh, integral, right? So um, this is kind of a weird uh, name, but it comes from the fact that this clutter of ST paths um, satisfies this condition, right? So. Uh, so we saw that um, the packing number was equal to um, the covering number, but this is true also uh, in this sense uh, with weights, right? So uh, this is an example of a max flow uh, min cut clutter. Um, and you can prove that, um, well, you can prove that by the max flow min cut theorem. So that's where the, that's where the name comes from. Um, Okay, so these uh, max flow min, min cut clutters um, are sort of a source of, of a lot of the beautiful uh, min max theorems you see um, in, in common optimization. So like Menger's theorem. Uh, and, and often whenever there's a, a, a min max theorem, it's often because um, there is a, a max flow min cut clutter uh, lurking in the background. So these are, are really beautiful clutters. Um, the problem is that they're not really that ubiquitous. Um, so there's not that many clutters that are max flow min cut. Um, so in this talk, we're interested in um, sort of a larger class of clutters that still uh, well behaved with respect to um, the covering problem. So suppose I only cared about the covering problem. So I don't really care about this dual problem. So we say that a clutter is ideal if just this primal LP um, has uh, an integral optimal solution for every choice of non-negative integer weight function. Um, so this is a little bit to digest, um, it's, a, it's a geometric concept. Um, so whenever this holds, we say that um, the clutter is ideal. And so for example, this means that 
uh, we can solve the covering problem just by solving the LP. Um, so we don't need the, the uh, integrality constraints because there's always an optimum integral solution. Um, so it means that we can efficiently solve the covering problem for these ideal clutters. Um, so this talk is, um, is about ideal clutters. Right? Um, so again, uh, that's, the, that's the definition. It's, it's a little bit uh, to digest, but um, it loosely says that um, you can solve the covering problem via an LP, right? just by solving an LP. Um, okay, so, um, so let me now, I guess, try to convince you that this notion of idealness is, is very natural and, and nice. So, uh, so for every clutter um, C, you can associate another clutter called the blocker of the clutter. And this clutter is just the family of minimal covers, right? Um, and because I'm taking just the, the minimal covers, um, this will automatically be a clutter. And the nice thing is that um, okay, so that's what I just said. Um, but the nice thing is that um, if you take the blocker of the blocker, um, you get the original clutter back. Um, so this is, uh, this is an involution. This is a duality relation. And it behaves nicely with respect to idealness. Um, so it turns out that a clutter is ideal uh, if and only if its blocker is ideal. Um, so this is one reason to think about ideal clutters instead of max flow min cut uh, clutters. Uh, this is not true for, for MF uh, MC clutters. Um, so another reason why ideal clutters are, are nice to work with is this notion of minors. So, um, right, so if I have a clutter, um, there's a notion of minors. So I've got um, two disjoint subsets, I and J. And what I want to do is I want to delete I and I want to contract J. So I just do the natural thing. So what I do is I look at the minimal sets. So first off, I, I, I take all members that are disjoint from I. So that's how I delete I. And of those members, I just uh, chop out um, J from each of them. And that's how I contract J. And the only tricky thing is when you do this, um, you might not get a clutter anymore because you might actually have uh, a member that's contained in another member. So you just take the, the minimal um, sets in this collection. So if you take the minimal sets, you get another clutter. And that's the clutter you get by deleting I and contracting J. Um, and again, the nice thing is that um, idealness behaves well uh, with respect to minors. So it turns out that uh, if a clutter is ideal, um, then every minor of it is also ideal, right? So, um, so that, I guess, raises the question of, well, what are the excluded minors uh, for ideal clutters? Um, so these are um, the minimal um, clutters under this minor relation that are um, not ideal, right? So this is not what this talk is about. Um, and, uh, but this is a nice question. So it turns out there's um, an infinite number of them. Um, but uh, this is this is not the topic of the course so, or of, of, of the talk, so I'm just going to uh, to move on, right? Uh, and so let me just give um, some examples of ideal clutters just to show that this is quite uh, a rich class. So we've already seen um, the clutter of ST paths of a graph. That's a max flow min cut clutter, so it's also an ideal clutter. There's also the clutter of edges 
of a bipartite graph. So we, we already saw that uh, for a general graph, um, you don't get an ideal clutter necessarily, but if you restrict to a bipartite graph, by Koenig's theorem, um, you actually get uh, an ideal clutter. Um, so these totally unimodular matrices also give you ideal clutters. Um, so what this means is for every um, clutter, you can associate a matrix, which is just the incidence matrix of the clutter. So, um, so the rows of the clutter are the members and the columns are um, the elements and you put a one if an element is in that member, right? Um, and if that matrix turns out to be a, a TU matrix, so this means that um, all the subdeterminants are um, one, zero, or minus one, uh, you get an ideal clutter. Um, so this is a, another rich source of examples. Um, so by the Lucchese-Younger theorem, the die cuts, the directed cuts of a die graph. So these are just the cuts where all the arcs go in the same direction. Uh, this is also uh, a clutter, an ideal clutter. And for the matroid theorists out there, um, the odd circuits of an odd K5 minor free sign graph, um, that's also an ideal clutter. So uh, I won't say what that is. It's not so important for the rest of the talk. Um, okay, so, um, so, um, so what I want to do is I want to just give a purely uh, combinatorial condition um, that will certify that a clutter is not ideal. So we say that a clutter is k-wise intersecting if every k members intersect, but they don't do so for a stupid reason. Um, so it's not the case that the reason that these k members intersect is because there's a single element um, that's in every single member. Um, so this condition just says that um, the covering number is at least two. So this means that it's not the case that there's an element that's in every single member, right? So this clutter is in some sense complicated. Um, so the, the hyper edges intersect kind of in a interesting way. So here is just an example. This is the Fano plane. Um, so it's a clutter on seven points where the members correspond to the lines. So this is a member here, this is a member here, this is a member here, and this is a projective plane. So it has the property that if you look at any two lines, they intersect, right? So this is a two wise intersecting clutter. Um, and so our conjecture is that um, there is some constant k, at least four, such that every k-wise intersecting clutter is not ideal, right? So we saw that idealness was this sort of strange um, geometric uh, condition. And we conjecture that um, this simple combinatorial condition is enough to certify that your clutter is not ideal, right? So, um, so it turns out that this is false for k equals three. So um, I'll give a proof of this later where uh, the example comes from the Peterson graph, right? As, as most counterexamples do. Um, so we need k to be at least four, uh, but it could actually be true for k equals four. So it could be that every four wise intersecting clutter is not ideal, right? Um, and assuming a, a conjecture of Paul Seymour uh, from 1975, um, our conjecture is true for k equals five. So, um, so this is uh, some evidence um, that the conjecture is true. And our main result is that uh, our conjecture is true 
for the class of binary clutters. So I'll say what uh, a binary clutter is uh, in a moment. So this is our, our main result, and this is kind of further evidence um, that the conjecture uh, is true, right? Um, and like I said, uh, we also show that um, there is a three-wise intersecting binary ideal clutter. Um, so this comes from um, the Peterson graph. So we'll see that uh, in a moment. So uh, you might not really like this um, KY's uh, intersecting property, but if you like thinking about hypergraphs, um, there is a kind of a reinterpretation of this condition in terms of the chromatic number of the clutter. Um, so, um, so let's say this, this K coloring of the clutter is, this is just the hypergraph definition of a K coloring. Well, okay, there are, there are more than one definition of how to color a hypergraph, but this one is quite natural. Um, so what I do is I assign um, colors to the vertices of my hypergraph in such a way that uh, no hyper edge is monochromatic. So it shouldn't be that um, all the elements of a hyper edge um, are the same color, right? So if your hypergraph uh, were a graph, this is just the normal notion of coloring, right? So it just says that the endpoints of your edge have to be different colors. Right, and the chromatic number of the clutter is just the smallest k for which the clutter the clutter has uh, a k coloring, right? Um, so it turns out that uh, our conjecture rephrased is is really about the chromatic number uh, of clutters, right? So it says that there is uh, some k that's at least four, such that every ideal clutter. Um, so there's a condition that says that, um, right, so if I want, if I want to color a, a hypergraph, it doesn't really make sense if I've got um, hyper edges of size at, at most one, right? So I mean, if I've got a hyper edge uh, with just one vertex, then there's no way that I can color so that that thing is not monochromatic because it only has one vertex. So of course I, I need this condition to be able to, to even color the, the, the hypergraph. Um, but as long as I have this, then it says that every ideal clutter, which was remember this geometric condition, uh, has bounded um, chromatic number, right? So um, that's what our conjecture says in terms of, of coloring, right? So if you're ideal, then you actually have bounded um, chromatic number. Um, so let me um, at least prove the, the equivalence um, of this rephrase conjecture in terms of the chromatic number and our, uh, our original conjecture, right? Um, so the main lemma you need is this relationship between the chromatic number and KY's intersecting, right? So it turns out that the chromatic number of a clutter is at most k, um, if and only if the blocker is not ky's intersecting, right? So, um, so if you prove this, then this is another way. This is how you kind of rephrase our our main conjecture, and the proof of this is is quite easy, right? So. Um, so let me at least just show one direction. The other direction is, is, um, is pretty much the same. Um, so let's take a clutter with chromatic number at most k, and let's take uh, a k coloring um, of the clutter. So these sets a1 to a k is just the partition of the vertex set um, into, into k different colors, right? Um, so what that means is that in each of these color classes, I better not have some member that's completely contained in some AI, right? Because this is a, this is a coloring, right? Um, so another way to say that is that if I 
take the complement of each AI, that is a cover of the clutter, right? Because it will hit every member. There's no member that's contained in just AI, right? Um, so in other words, what that means is that um, there is some BI, um, which is in the blocker. So remember the blocker is the set of minimal covers of the clutter such that BI is disjoint from AI, right? So there is something inside here um, that is a minimal cover, right? Um, and now I get that if I intersect uh, these K covers, um, I get the empty set because the union of the AIs is the entire ground set, right? So what I've found is K members of the blocker uh, which uh, whose intersection is empty. So this shows that the blocker uh, is not KY's intersecting, right? Um, so this is really, uh, our main conjecture is really just about um, the chromatic number. Um, okay, let me check the time. Okay, so um, let me just remind you of our two results. Um, and I want to prove this second one now. So I should actually tell you what um, a binary clutter is, right? So a clutter is binary um, if the intersection of every member and every member of the blocker is odd, right? So um, that's what a binary clutter is. And again, for the matroid theorist out there, um, a binary clutter is essentially just a signed binary matroid. Uh, so there are some terms here. So, um, okay, so a binary matroid is just, um, it's just a matrix where the entries are from the binary field. And all you do is you remember the circuits. So the circuits are just the subsets um, that are dependent and you take the minimal ones. That's a binary matroid. And a signed binary matroid is where you've got a assigning of the elements um, and a circuit is odd if it, if it contains an odd number of elements from the signing. Right, so, um, so a clutter is binary if and only if um, you can represent it as the set of odd circuits of some signed binary matroid, right? So uh, you can either think of binary clutters by this condition or you can think of them as signed uh, binary matroids. Um, and we need another class of clutters, uh, which are called cuboids. Um, so let me just define what a cuboid is. So you start off with your favorite set of zero one points. And so these, these are subsets uh, of an n element set. And the cuboid will be some subset of a two n element set. So the dimension uh, increases by a factor of two. So what you do is for every point um, in S, you inflate it by taking the complement. Um, so if X is in your set, then um, this sort of buddy of X is not in the set, right? And you do this uh, over all points of S. So an example will we'll make this clear, right? So, uh, right, so I've got a subset of zero one points, say living in the three dimensional cube. So say I've got zero, 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 one, zero, and one, one, one. Of course, I can think of these as sets. This is the empty set. Um, this is the set that contains all three points. And the cuboid of the set S is where it's a subset of a six element set. And for every point here, 
I take the complement. So, um, so for this zero, 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 I stick ones beside it. Uh, for zero, one, zero, this is a zero, so that becomes a one. That's a one, so that becomes a zero. That's a zero, and that becomes a one. So I just take, I have these extra coordinates where I just take the complement of the, of the corresponding uh, element, right? So that's the, that's the cuboid. And um, some remarks are in order. The cuboid, no matter uh, which set S that you start with, uh, the cuboid is always a clutter. And the reason that's the case is that, well, actually every member of the cuboid um, has size n, right? Because you've complemented um, everything, right? So, um, so these, the cuboid are n element subsets of a 2n element set. So because they all have the same size, they're automatically a clutter. Um, okay. The covering number is at most two, uh, because if you go back, well, if I look at any, if I look at two consecutive coordinates, there will always be a, a, a one, right, in either this coordinate or this coordinate. So any two, uh, well, well, these two consecutive coordinates or these two consecutive coordinates or these two consecutive coordinates will always be a cover of the cuboid. So the covering number of a cuboid is at most two. Um, so let's, um, let's think about what it means for a cuboid to be k-wise intersecting, right? So remember, k-wise intersecting means that uh, your covering number should be at least two. So there shouldn't be um, an element that's in all the members. So if you lift that to, or think about what happens in S, it means that S should not have a coordinate um, where all these, all these members agree, right? Because even if they agreed uh, as a zero, when you go to the cuboid, that would make the covering number one, right? You would get an element that's in everything. And it shouldn't be that you've got k points that agree on a coordinate. That's the k-wise intersecting part, right? So here, now we don't really care whether um, they intersect. Um, we don't. We don't want them to be all zero, even on a single coordinate. So that's what it means for the cuboid to be um, k-wise intersecting, um, and. Uh, right, so we say that a set is cube ideal if the cuboid of S is ideal, right? So, um, so you don't have to, I guess, read this theorem, um, but it's this is a characterization of when a set is cube ideal, right? So we know actually precisely. Um, when a set is cube ideal. It means you can, uh, right, so it means every facet um, is described by one of these inequalities, uh, which I won't say what they are, but the upshot is that uh, we, we understand what cube ideal sets are. Um, and uh, it's a theorem of, of Seymour that the cycle space of every graph uh, is a cube ideal set. Um, so the cycle space of a graph is, well, so you take the set of cycles of your graph and then you just, um, you just add them together. So you do addition modulo two. So when you do that, um, so you can add two cycles and that means you get um, basically an Eulerian subgraph. So a cycle is just, um, it's sort of bad. So then the notation kind of clashes, but uh, so for us, a cycle is just uh, a set of edges where all the, ver all the vertices have uh, even degree, right? Um, so if you take the set of cycles of every graph, that is always a cube ideal set. Right. Um, 
Okay. So, um, right. So now let's think about um, what it means for the cycle space to um, to be ky's intersecting. Um, so, if your cycles agree on a coordinate, um, it means that your graph has a bridge, right? So, um, right. So that's sort of the only way that um, that uh, these these cycles will will agree on a coordinate, um, and this this cycle space uh, has k plus one points that don't agree on a coordinate if and only if um, you can write the edges as the union of at most k cycles right so uh, with these two points we're kind of now ready to prove um, this second theorem right this example that shows that uh, there are three y's intersecting um, binary ideal clutters. Um, so the proof comes from um, the Peterson graph, of course. So here is the Peterson graph, right? And so by those two bullet points, um, I want to show that the cuboid of the cycle space of the Peterson graph um, gives me a ideal um, three Y's intersecting clutter, which means that um, I've got to show that the Peterson graph is not the union of two cycles. So remember, a cycle is an Eulerian subgraph, right? So of course, the, the Peterson graph is bridgeless, um, so it satisfies this first condition here. And I'm now going to show that um, it's not the union of um, two cycles, right? So remember cycle means Eulerian uh, subgraph. So suppose it is, suppose I can write the edges as the union of C1 and C2, right? So what that means is that if I take the complement of C1 and the complement of C2, um, I get Postman sets. So a Postman set is kind of the opposite of an Eulerian subgraph. It's a subgraph where all the vertices have odd degree, right? So the Peterson graph is cubic. So if I remove uh, a, an Eulerian subgraph, I get a subgraph where all the vertices have odd degree, right? So these are Postman sets. And because uh, these two cycles um, together, uh, their union is, is, is the entire set of edges, M1 and M2 are, are obviously disjoint, right? So I've got two disjoint sets of edges um, where all the vertices have odd degree. Um, so it can't be that, um, so that, that degree is either one or three, but it can't be that um, the degree is three, right? Because these guys are disjoint, right? So, um, so if one of them had degree three at a vertex, then it would it, it would not be disjoint from the other guy because that guy has also degree one or three at that vertex, right? So, these guys are actually perfect matchings, right? Because degree three is not possible. So, what I've found are um, two disjoint perfect matchings of the Peterson graph. And what that means is that there's also a third perfect matching um, because I can just subtract both of these guys out. So what I've done is I've written uh, the Peterson graph as uh, the union of, of three disjoint perfect matchings. All right, but, um, but you know, from your graph theory class, you probably proved that the Peterson graph is not three edge colorable, right? So it's, um, it's a snark, right? So this is, this is a contradiction, right? So, um, so it's, uh, so I cannot write um, 
the edges of the Peterson graph as the union of two cycles. So that shows that the cuboid of the cycle space of Peterson um, is a, uh, well, I didn't show that it's binary, but um, it, it is binary. So it is a three wise intersecting ideal clutter, right? Um, so let me just quickly finish up. I should finish soon, I guess, right, Nina? Okay, I, I, I assume silence. Okay, depends on what you mean by um, soon, you have another seven minutes. Seven minutes, okay. Um, Okay, I'll probably finish um, sooner than that. So uh, let me, I guess, for the remainder, just um, give the sketch of um, of the main theorem um, that every binary four-wise intersecting clutter is not ideal. Um, so the first step is that uh, somewhat surprisingly. Uh, we show that we only need to prove the conjecture for cuboids. Um, so cuboids seemed kind of restrictive, um, where um, you start with a set and um, you make this um, enlarged cuboid, but they're the only things you actually have to prove uh, the conjecture for. Um, so that's, that's step one. Um, and so now, we need to understand uh, the cuboid of basically um, binary matroids. So the cycle space of a, of a binary matroid is cube ideal, if and only if it has the so-called uh, sums of circuits property. Um, so, um, so for us, you don't really need to know what the sums of circuits property is. Um, but uh, there's a decomposition theorem for the sums of circuits property, right? So Seymour proved that um, you can get all the binary matroids with the sums of circuits properties basically by gluing together um, graphic matroids um, and some, well, two other, um, two other matroids, the Fano and, um, and the dual of the Wagner graph. Um, so by Seymour's theorem, this actually reduces things down to graphs, actually, right? So now all we need to do is to prove the theorem for, for graphs. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we just use the eight flow theorem, right? So proving the theorem for graphs means I want to show that um, every bridgeless graph, um, I can write the edges of every bridgeless graph um, as the union of a constant number of, of cycles. So remember a cycle is just an Eulerian uh, subgraph. And you, it turns out you can do that with three, right? So it turns out that every graph, um, its edges, you know, every bridgeless graph, you can write its edges as a union of three cycles. Um, and that, that follows from the eight flow theorem. So this is probably something else you learned uh, in your graph theory class um, that uh, every bridgeless graph has an eight flow um, so normally, the eight flow theorem you, th you think of as um, orienting your edges and then assigning numbers um, from uh, one to eight, so that um, at every vertex, um, the flow in is equal to the flow out. That's what an eight flow is. Um, but there's some classic flow theorems that say, well, your graph has an eight flow um, if and only if it has a, a Z8 flow, so a, a flow over Z8. And then it turns out that having a group valued flow is equivalent to having um, a flow over a group that has the same size. So having an eight flow 
is the same thing as having a, a Z2 times Z2 times Z2 flow, right? So I use Z2 times Z2 times Z2. And if you think about what a Z2 times Z2 times Z2 flow is, well, it just means that if you think of each of those coordinates as, um, as uh, basically corresponding to a cycle, it means that you can write um, the edges of your graph as the union of, of three Eulerian subgraphs. So having a Z2 times Z2 times Z2 flow is exactly uh, what we need to prove the theorem for graphs. Um, okay, so I think I will um, stop there and take questions. Thanks. Thank you, Tony. <laughs> Questions? Sure, I'll ask a question. Um, this probably there was a good reason why you didn't mention this, Tony, but do you have a quick explanation of how reducing the conjecture, the sorry, the theorem to the case of cuboids goes? Uh, yeah, sure. So, um, yeah, so it turns out that if you kind of look at a minimal counterexample, um, they're what we call like tangled clutters. Um, so you can always kind of delete things to like reduce the covering number down to two, exactly. Uh, and you can also assume that uh, every member is in some minimal cover. Um, so once you do this, then it turns out that you can kind of find um, a cuboid sitting inside this, this minimal uh, counter, this, this tangled clutter. So first you can reduce to, to tangled clutters, and then you can reduce further to cuboids, actually. Um, so uh, it, it's a little bit surprising, but, um, but it's nice. And I, I mean, it shows that cuboids are kind of the, the right thing to, to think about. So. Thanks. Uh, hi, I'm wondering uh, if these theorems are effective in the sense of computational complexity. Um, the question makes sense. I think the question makes, yeah. So for example, I guess, um, yeah, like one thing I guess you might want to know is, so suppose I guess our theorem is true, um, can you say efficiently find um, sort of this fractional um, this fractional point right that certifies that your your clutter is not ideal right so um, yeah so that's non trivial I think um, and yeah I mean I think these questions um, you have to be a little bit careful because like clutters can also have like exponential size. Um, so like, um, yeah, like I think, uh, yeah, I think it's even an interesting like computational question of like given two clutters, like decide if one is the blocker of the other. Uh, going right back to the definition of ideal clutter, uh, you defined in terms of the LP having integer solutions, but can you, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> in polynomial time, can you find an integer solution? Um, yeah, so I guess another way to say it is, is that, yeah, because this actually holds for all the, all the integer weight functions, an equivalent way to say it is just to, right, so that means you can optimize in, in any integer direction. So it turns out that it's equivalent to just that polytope having only integer vertices. Okay, but you have to find a vertex. Yeah, I mean, you just run, I mean, you run the simplex method. The simplex method's not polynomial time. Well, okay, I mean, you... I'm giving you a hard time. <laughs> 
No, no, okay. It's actually the, the polynomial time I mean, methods like interior point method usually yeah. don't give you a vertex. Ah, oh, right. Um, yes, yes. Uh, <coughs> so, um, yeah, but yeah, that's 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 a good point. Um, but yeah, so, but I guess I should stress that it, another definition of ideal is that yeah, like all the vertices of that polytope I wrote down are are. <coughs> yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think when you find the optimum facet, you can probably add another direction to your constraints to force it to the edge of the facet <laughs> and keep going like that until you find a vertex. But uh, working out the details is another yeah. matter. And I, I think it's, it's an interesting question. Yeah, like if you're not ideal to find this, uh, this um, yeah, like you want to be able to find this, this fractional um, vertex, right? Like given this combinatorial condition, you know, can you actually efficiently find um, this fractional vertex? Um, I think that's a, that's a good question as well. Thanks. And more on computation. So your characterization of the cube ideal um, uh, clutters, is that somehow effective combinatorially or computationally? Uh, yeah, that's not me actually. That's, um, I guess that's a theorem of, of Ahmed. Uh, okay, let me, yeah, it's quite, okay, where is it? It's here, I guess. Oh no, is it here? I guess no, it's I'm... much later when you introduce cube ideal stuff. Yeah, so um, anyway, that's a theorem of, I guess, Ahmed, um, I think Gerard, um, Natalia, Gurkanova, and Debian. Uh, oh yeah, here it is. Um, yeah, so, um, I guess I just have to say what these generalized set covering inequalities are, but they're all they're all they're pretty clean, I guess, right? So it means that, yeah, you just have um, disjoint sets, and every facet should be given by. I mean, these are easy, um, and these actually are pretty pretty clean, I think, as well, right? So. Um, Right, so I guess the question is, um, yeah, it's also a good algorithmic question of deciding, uh, deciding cube idealness, right. Um, but this, I guess, it was not really going to be constructive because I think deciding, uh, wait, maybe, yeah, I'm, I'm not sure, yeah. I don't, yeah. So there is an algorithmic question of, of deciding cube idealness. <clears throat>